Greetings to all you wonderful people out there already aware of me and what I do. Uh, before I launch into my weekly monologue, I just want to offer up a quick reminder that everyone should check out my patreon.com site. Uh, by joining my patreon.com site and parting with the necessary modest sum of cash on a monthly or annual basis, you get to show your support for the channel. It's that simple. Um, because it's money that makes the world go round, including this podcast. Uh, it's also it's a great site, you know. It's uh, Go and have a look. Uh, you get early access to everything that I do. Uh, exclusive question and answer video every week that only happens on Patreon.com. Uh, competitions with prizes. Uh, it'd be great to see you there. Uh, okay, that's the end of the uh, advertorial. Uh, it's now time for this week's Thought of the Week. You know that quote um, from, what is she, a, a German-American, American-German, can't remember which way around it is, writer, Hannah Arendt. Um, and she uh, she covered, almost like a reporter, the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the, the Nazi administrator and organiser, uh, Adolf Eichmann, uh, long after World War II, um, Whatever. And anyway, in terms of the quote, she came up with this line about the banality of evil. Uh, she was a philosopher, a historian, I think, and she she pondered across the pages that she wrote uh, about how Eichmann had been more or less a bureaucrat. That you know, well, he, he probably didn't actually get blood on his hands directly. He, that um, that. He had been he had been a facilitator of all that happened, and he excused his part in the horror of it all by saying that he was just doing his job. You know, he was told to, to organise a project, and that's what he did. And so she said that this was to look on at this, to look on at someone uh, disavowing and 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 dis, you know obfuscating and distancing themselves was the banality of evil. Anyway, I think a lot about the banality of evil now. And I first heard about it when I was at school in the context of Hannah Arendt and Eichmann, but it's, it's sort of bubbled up closer and closer to the surface. And I think about how many people in positions of power over our lives uh, are knowingly overseeing the dismantling of the civilization of the West. Countries like Britain and countries like America obviously, are being dismantled right before our eyes. And, and the ways of life that have been possible here for a couple of hundred years or more uh, are, are just being uh, taken apart bit by bit, like, a, like an old Meccano structure. And, and furthermore, the, the same people that are, that are overseeing that uh, dismantling are, are also overseeing death. Seeing, overseeing the death of fellow human beings. And while they do so, they're only seeing pound signs and dollar signs that, that result from all their banal evil. But, but of course, banal might be the best you could say about what they're doing. It's possible, at least, that as well as profiting in a banal way, from chaos and death and destruction, that they also enjoy it. In which case, their actions would be described as straightforward evil. But who could say definitively without being able to look into each and every one of the hearts in question? But nonetheless, overseeing the dismantling of the West is what they're doing and knowingly condemning at the same time hundreds of thousands of men, women and children to death around the world. So it's what they're doing. How are we to understand behaviour like this? I think some of it has to do with ego. I sort of need to rewind a bit probably. I, I have had to admit to myself that for the first 50 odd years of my life, 
I was too blind to see what was happening around me. I didn't pay attention to events in the macro, in the micro. And it's been an embarrassing, it's even been a humiliating process of self-realisation. You know, like a lot of people probably, I thought I was smart, <laughs> smart enough. You know, I, I thought I was quite well educated, you know, finished school, I'd been to university a couple of times. And so well enough educated, let's say, and I thought I knew what's what. You know, I thought I had a handle on what was going on. But the last few years, the last three or four years, have provided me with the most confronting and humbling education so far in my life. And I've been left with no alternative but to accept I didn't know a damn thing about the ways of the world. I was naive. That's the that's the best I could say about myself. I was naive. And I've spent the last four years trying to catch up. And I think part of the problem is that too many people are still convinced they're smart and well-educated. And... As a result, they stubbornly refuse to admit that they've got it all or most of it wrong. You know, a lot of them did at the time and, and still are uh, cheerleading all that was wrong, thinking it was right. Uh, you know, the so-called vaccines and the lockdowns and the, all the rest of it. And, and they, you know, and they, they shouted about defending democracy in Ukraine and, and so on and so on. But... And and they've been about that business for far too long. It's so long, in fact, that I would say that the stupid smart people, for such as that is what they are, uh, they seem to have opted simply to keep their heads down at best. At best, because accepting and coming to terms with the realisation they were, like me uh, and many others, too dumb or at least too gullible to see what was going on, well, that, that's, that, that admission, that self-admission is just too much for too many people on account of their egos. They can't do it. Admitting they were wrong is still beyond them. And it might remain beyond them, even as they finally topple into their graves. Ego is preventing people seeing many things. But it's preventing people seeing that the state, the institutions, they're off. Those tasked and trusted with the well-being of the nations and and of those citizens resident here are not fit for purpose. The state and the institutions are not fit for purpose, if they ever were. And ego is surely a part, but only part of the explanation for the way senior politicians here in the UK, in France, in Germany, in Poland, in the United States of America and elsewhere are behaving in relation to war. War. Anyone paying attention to reality knows that Russia has won its war with Ukraine. You know, it's probably better described as a proxy war that the US and NATO indulged in with Ukraine as the bait. But whatever it was, uh, it's over, all bar the shouting. The shouting and the screaming of men and boys condemned to die, even now. That die was cast for Ukraine and Ukrainians years ago. You know, going back two years, it had made sense for, for Ukraine, via puppet Zelensky, to, to sign a peace deal with Russia back in April 2022 the same peace deal that NATO bag carrier Boris Johnson was dispatched to scupper and did scupper so as well as peace consigned to oblivion so too were the lives of well, it's anybody's guess approximately 600,000 Ukrainian soldiers that have since been shoved through the meat grinder and despite what we were told, that war was never about defending democracy. It was about money. And it was about the determination of the US and NATO to poke the Russian bear in hopes of securing regime change in the Kremlin. Because securing regime change is what the US does. Uh, also securing access to Russian wealth, of which there's a great deal 
in terms of natural resources. You know, and by now, hundreds of billions of dollars and pounds and euros have been laundered through that charnel house of Ukraine for the enrichment of the few. And even now, after all of it, pundits and mainstream media figures here in the UK and elsewhere continue to talk of the West standing up for freedom and democracy. It's impossible to be certain in the case of every pundit why they're still saying such things. Perhaps they're just gullible. Perhaps their egos, and some of them have famous egos, continue to blind them to facts. But that would be the kindest assessment of their behaviour. And then, of course, we have to contemplate our leaders and those that pull our leaders' strings, whose names and faces we know not. Here in the UK, we have unelected Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and unelected Foreign Secretary David Cameron, both talking about war as business, about war securing the defence industry, uh, war as excellent value for money, on account of how it's Ukrainians and Russians that are dying and have died, not British soldiers or American soldiers. That makes it value for money, according to David Cameron. Uh, in the US, in Congress to be specific, the, the elected representatives there waved Ukrainian flags to celebrate voting to spend more tens of billions of dollars in the name of Ukraine. A country that, to be quite honest, may or may not still actually exist in any meaningful sense. Tens of billions of dollars that will, in the end, up finishing American bank accounts. That's where they're going. A Republican called Tim Wahlberg, who happens to be a, a former evangelical Christian pastor, evoked Hiroshima and Nagasaki in relation to the, the the best approach he thought should be taken towards Gaza and to, to Russia. You know, he said, forget anything humanitarian, just go in like we did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and get it over with. An evangelical Christian pastor and elected Republican representative in Congress. US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, he has he has taken and supported the war as profit uh, line, you know, alongside David Cameron. Donald Trump, who once, not so very long ago, boasted that he would stop the war there in a day, who said he just wanted to stop all the killing and dying. Well, something's happened there because he seems now to be in support of the latest spending of those tens of billions of dollars. None of it is about defending democracy, about securing peace and freedom. It's about money and power. Most recently, you know, now, this week, uh, there's talk of sending British, French and American troops to fight in Ukraine. Boots on the ground, as we say. <clears throat> sending them to fight a war the Russians have already won in every way that matters. Uh, Vladimir Putin has already warned France and its president Emmanuel Macron that any French soldiers sent to Ukraine will suffer the same fate as Napoleon's soldiers in Russia 200 years ago. Um, Dmitry Medvedev, who in his time has been Russian Prime Minister and he's still there in the Kremlin or thereabouts, he has called the sabre-rattling Western leaders irresponsible scoundrels if not lunatics. He said, there is some total degradation of the ruling class in the West. This class genuinely refuses to logically connect elementary things. And in, in the same uh, outburst, he reminded the West and the world that NATO troops on the ground in Ukraine is a declaration of war. De facto, between the West and Russia. And he reminded the West and the world about the inevitability of nuclear war if NATO remained on that path. He said, none of them will be able to hide either on Capitol Hill 
In the Elysee Palace or at 10 Downing Street, a global catastrophe will ensue. By the way, he said, Kennedy and Khrushchev understood this over 60 years ago, but today's infantile idiots, infantile idiots, who have clawed their way to power in the West, stubbornly refuse to realise it. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh. Russia, as has been made clear in the past two years, is on a war footing. It's, it's there. It's up and running. It has a wartime economy. It's tooled up its factories, and it's already in the business of churning out the stuff of war. Which, you know, if anyone decides to go to war, that you can't start those engines cold. It's it's a matter of many months, if not years, before factories are are in the rhythm of producing the stuff of war. And our our factories are are not there. They're not in they're not on. They're not switched on. They're sitting cold and idle. And Russia has strength in depth in terms of money, in terms of natural resources, in terms of people. It's got 100 million more people than Ukraine, just for starters. And Russia is not fooling around. And what do we have here in the West? What, what, what do we have in the, in the face of glaring reality? You know, reality that's glowing blood red. We have serial inadequates like Rishi Sunak and David Cameron. You know, the United States of America has a senile president whose strings are being pulled by those for whom war is the most lucrative game in town. And, and, and across Europe, we have heads of state, desk jockeys, office boys, millionaire bankers, for too many of whom war appears to be a game they think they can play and even win in the face of that Russia. And, you know, all of this is, is in part the consequences of we the people surrendering consciously or unconsciously, willingly or unwillingly, responsibility for ourselves and our loved ones. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, for too long, too many of us left others to get on with the business of making and keeping us safe. Our predecessors obviously surrendered the means, the practical means to defend themselves uh, against enemies foreign and domestic, and give all that up long ago. And the deal was, uh, has been that citizens render themselves helpless, you know, completely defenseless, like, like naked babes in the face of it all on the understanding that the state would shoulder that responsibility. Don't you worry your pretty little heads about protecting yourselves. Uh, we'll do that. Now, an arrangement like that works as long as the state cares to defend us. <laughs> and as long as the state in question is, well, at least benevolent towards its citizens, even just absent-minded. One way or another, we now have a state that is at best ambivalent about our safety and our well-being. And, and a more cynical interpretation might be that the state is actively undermining that well-being. You know, it's, it's taking that apart, making that impossible, that it's ready to cast us aside or under the bus in pursuit of ends that are dictated by those who see themselves as governing not sovereign nation states in the good old-fashioned way, but who see themselves as governing the world as one. The one world government types are behind the active dismantling of nation states, of civilization, so that they can replace it with a world reshaped in their own image. But either way, we are now in the hands of those who care not a jot what happens to resident populations in a country like Britain, in a country like the United States of America. It's elected representatives of that mindset who are now posturing on the world stage on our behalf. What could possibly go wrong? 
Russia has made it clear that it's serious. And it's not the kind of business that the prime miniatures of Europe have learned to make their own personal millions from. No doubt egos are in play, as, as, as you'd expect from, from men who routinely wear lifts in their shoes <laughs> so they can see over their desks. Um, the most we can hope for is that it's brinkmanship that we're dealing with, a high-stakes game of chicken. I've said before, and I'll say again, that it's my hope, at least, that these peacocks, these strutting inadequates, don't actually plan to risk their pampered, indulged existences with anything quite so final as World War Three. You know, God forbid anything might happen to rumple their suits or break their windows. The dire problem for the rest of us is that those inadequates look increasingly capable of taking us into World War III, if not by psychopathic intent, then by mistake. By misreading a situation. And at the sharp end of it right now, for example, are Ukrainian soldiers who know the war is over for them, that they're on the losing side. They know the war's over and that all that remains for them and what remains of their future uh, is, to, is to die for the sake of the increased profit of the already rich. And at best, at best, their leaders, like our leaders, are playing the most dangerous game imaginable with the lives of every one of us.